there any specific questions from the audience, uh, you're more than welcome uh, there were, to participate as well. There were people who wanted to ask uh, Angela. Angela some questions, so come to the floor, we'll get that out of the way. There's no avoiding it, darling. Are you ready, Angie? Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> Go. Your comment on transverse imaging. Mm -hmm. The reason we um, decided not to include transverse imaging for uh, diagnosis of reflux in last year's first annual conference um, is because when you look at phys uh, ultrasound, it's physics, all angles, angles for the Doppler response. When you have the aorta coming down, it's basically not, nothing's 100%, but it's basically a straight fall. Your jugular comes from more posterior coming to the front, so it's angled. If you go at zero disease degrees on those two vessels and your jugular is angled, you no longer have a zero degree and you can make the color change to whatever you want because of the angles. So yes, it'll give you a hint that there might be reflux, but you can never diagnose reflux in a transverse plane. It's just the laws of physics for ultrasound. Right, right. So that's why I had said I think that you know us evolving and adding to it is key, but I don't think that we should throw it out. I mean, I can but give you another never, If you don't throw it out, it'll never stand up in the laws of physics well, and no radiologist again, okay. would ever agree to it. Right, but also, I mean, I mean, we can go back to the talk of you know PPG. I mean, that went out with the Atari like 30 years ago, right? However, sometimes we'll still do a PPG. So is because when Doppler ultrasound came out and you know duplex came out, they sort of you know with pressures and, and the duplex together, they said, well, you know, what's the sense? Well, you know what? Sometimes and you know the uh, pulse volume pulse volume recording as well. Sometimes they do it um, when you're certainly in, in a strictly vascular lab. When I'm working for the surgeon, you know, sometimes that's what he wants. So you know you're pulling out old things. So you you can't always throw it away. You kind of have to remember and, and even just like. Um, again, Dr. Sandra, how she was just up here again, and, and you'll notice a lot of their assessment and, and what they're showing you is still in the transverse plane. So, right, right? so it's just, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we, it, it's gonna be the end all and be all, but I, again, you need to remember where we started, and I right. think that and needs to be incorporated. all those tests you were talking about were all verified tests. Transverse is not a verified test, it never has been in ultrasound, it's just against physics laws. Just so, you, just so okay, everyone's thanks. correct on that. Dr. Tarawala. All right, um, thanks actually. This was just a comment that I had for you, Angela. Um, you had sort of mentioned that one of the things that would be really useful would be to have like a web space or a database mm -hmm. for criteria. And um, there's actually one that's been created that I think would be an excellent one to duplicate. It's actually for nuchal translucency. Okay. Um, it was actually created by uh, Kyrgios um, Nicolaitis in Greece. And basically what he's done is he's basically put out all these little web videos saying, okay, if you want to do nuchal translucency, which is a, um, it's a screen for Down syndrome yeah. at you know, 11 to 13 week ultrasound, yeah. it's really important that you have this plane, this plane. And so what they've done is created this entire web teaching area. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to be certified as an ultrasound technologist to be able to do it, you actually have to demonstrate that you're competent in all these various levels and then you actually get a certificate and actually to get that initially you have to submit a certain number of cases to like a central repository and then Nicolaides reviews it and says yes these are good and so that way it's actually a way of delivering consistency and consistency for a new ultrasound technique and I, I think like you know I can give you the website and I think it would be for a sure. fantastic way to um, you know instead of trying to duplicate the wheel because he's done it really well and um, one of the things if you actually look over the course of the nine years that he's actually had this website, you can actually see the number of clinicians and ultrasound technologists who are actually applying this technique. Um, like it's basically increasing on the order of about um, 200 a month. So um, it's actually very, very useful and I would recommend, you know, in this area where Doppler is being applied in an entirely new field, an entirely new te technique, that you want to adopt something like that where you can main, make sure that everybody's doing it the correct way and accurately. So I Thank can give you that website later. Thank you. Uh, that's a great comment and uh, uh, I think that's already uh, in process. Angela, my comment uh, is with the uh, transverse, I'm not going to let it go, transverse uh, <laughs> documentation of reflux. My question is how do you document length of reflux? Are you 
Putting your spectral in transversely and measuring it also? No. Nope. Why? Because well, I do it in sagittal. Why? Right. Well, because. But, I mean, okay. I can do it in transverse if I wanted to, if I'm just looking for time on the bottom, right? I mean, that's obviously that's the scale I'm using. Sure. So, and I guess my point is, is you do it in sagittal because that's the accurate way to, right. to do a measurement. And right. I think that it's just a better view. And, you know, you can have pulsatility of the jugular veins if you hit the freeze button at the right spot or the wrong spot. You can show reflux in a lot of people who truly don't have reflux. Agreed. And that's why I said basically is we're growing with it. It's evolving from it. But I'm not saying relying on the, on the transverse for the reflux. I'm saying it's a sort of a second checkpoint. So I think that's what everybody needs to, that's my message. I'm not jumping on the transverse bandwagon or anything. I mean, I, I too have an RVT, so I did pass the physics exam. So I, I sort of know about it a little bit. So um, that's, I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's just a second checkpoint. That's it. You know, I think the transverse view has a role uh, for those of us who treat. The cross-sectional area is very valuable in selecting balloons. I understand. I understand you. I understand. Yes. Hi, uh, Maura Griffin from London. I mean, Angela's right and Karen's right. At the end of the day, what this boils down to is experience. Mm -hmm. And for the inexperienced person, transverse is not a good idea. But for someone who's been properly trained, understands the laws of physics, understands their equipment, understands their settings, it's okay. It's okay as a second check, mm -hmm. but you have to have reached a certain level to be able to actually accurately say that. And it's purely looking as a, as a backup in color, not as doctor measurements, never, mm -hmm. never in transverse. Thank you. Thank you. So, so maybe, maybe I, I tell you what, uh, how do, do I perform this examination? Uh, of course, transverse uh, uh, imaging is okay just to have idea what happens here, but uh, when I detect something which looks like reflux, then I look at this area in the longitudinal section. Ch I'm changing uh, angle, changing gating, and actually, in my opinion, in most of the cases, this so-called reflux uh, is not a reflux. Uh, there were some patients with real reflux, but they were very, very infrequent, infrequent cases. And most of this, this case, uh, these slides which are uh, shown uh, and uh, the authors were claiming that was a in my opinion, they, they were just artifacts. Dr. Liasis. Um, actually, this, uh, this agreement uh, makes uh, urgent the need uh, to, to follow the same protocol. And uh, I was very lucky to participate in this multi-center study. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean the study from Professor Nicolaidis. And it is not uh, via web's uh, site, but all of us, we visit St. Mary's. And we stay there for five days, and we follow the same protocol. So we have to do, in a way, in the same way. This is the best way. And another good idea from one video about IVUS, which you gave us, is that uh, during inspiration, expiration, there was no changes in cross-sectional area. But we can get information about this uh, using the Doppler. We, lo we lose the facility. So maybe it's one more criteria. I don't know. Dr. Zvadnov. So what I would like to comment is, you know, uh, uh, this session when it was uh, taught and organized, obviously we uh, wanted to cover uh, all, all modalities, but uh, what has been said yesterday, I think it's also very important to consider, and that's what's the consensus on multimodal imaging. Uh, A, for the screening of this problem, and B, for going forward, who is uh, qualifying to be, you know, seen on an on a invasive basis and further diagnosed. Now, clearly, uh, there is very little literature about that, uh, uh, hopefully increasing. I, I showed over these two days number of slides, you know, uh, in which uh, the asterisks of those studies that used more than one techniques uh, can be really, you know, calculated, I mean, uh, on, on, on one hand. Uh, and, and I think that it's extremely important that we as a society 
uh, uh, encourage uh, all researchers to uh, begin use more than one technique, whether this will be two non-invasive techniques, it's still better than just one. For, and, and, and if that can be coupled with invasive tests, uh, 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 like catheter venography, I was uh, in the premise study, we used five techniques. We also wanted to understand what's the value of computer tomography. I think this will increase our confidence in, in trying to, to find the, the, the right answer for right stenosis and for right intraluminal abnormality and for the really value and sensitivity and specificity of these techniques. I would just like to add that the biggest problem into this is that we are suffering of seeing just the MS patients when you go to the site on the multimodal. It's very hard uh, that any IRB is going to approve to Dr. Siddiqui, at least our IRB does not approve to Dr. Siddiqui to perform IVUS in, in healthy controls uh, or catheter venographies. And I think that as a society, we will need to think uh, how, you know, to uh, uh, collect this type of data with a similar type of imaging that we are doing in MS patients. Uh, I'd like to respond to that, Robert. We have done for many years contrast arteriography, and many of those patients are healthy controls except for, you know, an acute aneurysm or a trauma, yet they have delayed imaging that is transarterial venography. Perhaps, perhaps that is our uh, opportunity that's already been created. We actually looked at uh, this, uh, we looked at uh, just this summer, we did 200 angiograms, non-MS patients uh, who were getting angiography for intracranial aneurysms and uh, non-fistulous connections, so didn't have an AVM or AVF. And, uh, the fact of the matter is that one, the opacification of the veins is not as good as during transvenous angiography. The second is that the overall narrowing which is noted in the region of the, particularly the jugular valves is rather similar to what has been reported in CCSVI. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the right IJ, left IJ. Um, and it really, uh, and, and third, you don't see the acidus almost true, ever. True. So th those three things have been detrimental in terms of trying to take, you know, uh, we have a large volume of arterial angiograms and we, you know, every, we know we are going to go all the way through the phase, but for those three reasons, we did not find that data really useful. Okay. Yes. Hi, Randy Benson from uh, Detroit uh, and a neurologist. Sorry about Sorry, that. Sorry, scared me. It was really what? loud. Was Are you awake now, Angela? I am so good now. Okay, because I, I thought you were sleeping. <laughs> Not really. So I come at it from, uh, in a way, an outsider's perspective uh, as a neurologist and, and kind of new to this, this area through uh, Dr. Hakey of CCSVI. But uh, having treated uh, MS patients for, uh, for many years, um, I look at it like um, we have a gold standard. And the gold standard is these plaques that we can see so readily uh, on flare and T2 and, and T1, right? And here we are, here you are, trying to come up with um, common elements, trying to standardize uh, a protocol where the goal or the objective is, to me, a, a little bit fuzzy, right? So we have specialists in different imaging modalities, different interventionalists um, going as far as they can admirably with, uh, with their techniques. Yeah. And the goal is to image and to identify abnormalities. But I'd like to submit to you that, and maybe even playing devil's advocate here, what we need to do is to try to bridge the gap between the abnormalities that we see structurally and the venous abnormalities, if they are abnormalities, when they're abnormalities, maybe in at least several cases 
idealized cases where you see plaques on one side but not the other side of the brain, where you have Devix disease, where you have a confluent plaque in the brainstem <clears throat> and, and the cervical spine, um, where you actually can stand a, a very good probability of merging your venous abnormalities with what you see on structural MRI. I think you would probably go a long way to convincing your colleagues here today, but certainly uh, those skeptics out there that uh, question the validity and the utility uh, of this approach altogether. So that's, that's really, this may not be the right forum or the right you know, panel discussion, but I had to get it out there. Comments? Yeah, so let me take this person. I'm sure Mark and everybody else wants to jump in. Um, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, I think um, it, that's where prospective randomized trials really become important is that the final result would be that doing what we think might be helpful is going to result in not only a clinical correlate but a radiographic correlate of progression of disease which is reduction in active uh, relapses, reduction in uh, flare signals, reduction in active enhancing plaques, etc. And we are doing that as part of our prospective randomized trial comparing sham angioplasty versus angioplasty, one. But in terms of trying to correlate anatomically where the lesions are, it's a very different, for example, venous drainage of the brain um, is structured so that the vast majority of the deep structures, the thalamic and deep white matter tracts, they drain through the galenic system into the straight sinus, and that usually drains out the left transverse into the left sigmoid, left IJ, whereas the cortical uh, drains out usually the right transverse, usually because, again, there are predominances. So there is, it's, it's hard to be symmetric or asymmetric in terms of plaque because of a lesion in one place or the other because you have bilaterality there. Um, and so it's really hard to localize specifically where the lesions are. That being said, Zamboni's original um, data strongly correlated the location of these venous anomalies with the type of multiple sclerosis so that secondary progressive was much more associated with azagus and spinal cord issues. Uh, primary progressive was associated with uh, azagus and spinal cord issues rather than relapsing remitting which was more uh, associated with azagus. So I think the effort is being made that way, it's just that we are not far enough along the spectrum to really have the data that we need to convince more people. And, and maybe Randy you were also thinking of a more direct connection in the sense that uh, by using that unilateral argument, if you had stenosis in the left internal jugular and you had seen only left lesions, well, that would be nice. Of course, it would be a direct correlate. If you could prove that by opening that up, the perfusion increased, or as David Hubbard showed, potentially the functional brain response improved, that would be great. But this bilaterality really confuses the issue that way. It makes it much harder to deal with. Uh, I think the, the reason, for example, we had uh, the session on perfusion with Yulin Gu speaking and Robert Zabadinoff and others was to try and actually demonstrate that these could be real quantitative objective measures that, uh, as Adnan said, if we could follow these pre and post treatment and demonstrate a clear perfusion improvement along with a clear flow improvement in the jugulars. I mean, we're certainly trying to do that. Uh, maybe there are other directions we haven't taken that may be possible. Uh, I think we're finally, as a group and a society, getting to the point where enough studies are being done that we're going to be having data in the terms of hundreds of patients, hopefully, in the next year. And a number of other papers are also coming out in that direction that are starting to point to those answers. We don't. We don't quite have a full picture of this yet, but uh, I think we're at least trying to tackle that. So maybe you have another suggestion. Well, in addition to the laterality issue, there is the resolution issue. So uh, do we have the resolution with our venographic uh, capabilities 
uh, to see these, these smaller veins that uh, presumably relate spatially uh, closer to uh, these, these plaques. Is it a resolution issue? Uh, it's, it's a functional issue of where we're uh, performing the venogram. We're looking at the downstream presumed problem that has an upstream effect. Our goal is not necessarily to see a correlation between the vein in the brain. But or should, should it be? No, we, so. think, we don't think so. We think that we're looking at a downstream cause of an upstream problem. And You're saying there's no connection functionally between the downstream cause? No, no. I'm saying that it's a, a technically uh, perhaps irrelevant uh, from a practical point of view, but we can see the veins, but not by catheter. We see them through the susceptibility imaging, et cetera. Right. So right. We, you have to understand, for, I'm going to be editorial here a bit. Three years ago, I would guess that uh, the overwhelming majority of the people in this room had never heard of Paolo Zamboni or C CSVI. And in three years, we've come to this point. I dare say that, um, that we need people like you to pull in more, to bring out more questions than answers. We need stimulation to answer the questions. Uh, you know, we're not all, neuro many of us have no neurological background. And I had only met one person with multiple sclerosis before I treated my first patient. Uh, so this is a, in a very nascent uh, time, and what's slowing it down more than anything is the absence of n neurological collaboration. And we applaud you for being here. about anatomical correlation between vascular and neurological uh, pathology. And it was, in terms of, of plaques within the brain, is very difficult because of just of anatomy. But with one, one exception from this rule, uh, I mean the optic nerves and the retina. Uh, and there are some historical uh, publication which uh, uh, was found that uh, prevalence of optic neuritis is a little bit uh, higher on the left side, which cannot be completely uh, understood uh, on basing on the autoimmune or other other uh, theoretics. Uh, we performed uh, evaluation of our patient in terms of venographic findings and uh, ophthalmological findings, and we found a very nice correlation between left and right side in terms of uh, optic coherence tomography of the retina pathology and in terms of, of a venography. So at least in this territory there is a correlation. Of course it's not a direct proof but something is, is going on and, and statistics, is very, statistics are, are very nice. So at least maybe here is a correlation between these findings or at least it, it needs uh, further, uh, further research in this area. And I would like just to add, you know, that you are raising a very important point, and I would echo what uh, 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 Dr. Slafani said. We are really at the beginning, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I have been the first one, uh, uh, and, and then others, Dr. Haki and others, promoting association studies between, you know, uh, looking into this problem and MRI. And we are totally just on the beginning. I mean, uh, uh, just to give you an idea where this gap stands, in the recently uh, 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 accepted paper of mine in American Journal of Neuroradiology with a title, No Association of CCSVI with Conventional MRI Findings, in which we uh, uh, show that there is no significant association with T2 lesion volume and brain atrophy, uh, the, the reviewers, you know, made like uh, 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 a samurai harakiri to get the, that paragraph out, uh, which is saying that uh, uh, correlation with other 
MRI metrics, including iron, perfusion, and others, uh, have to be pursued given some pilot findings. And, you know, if we don't go in that direction, and, and I think these two sessions in the morning have been really excellent to prove that there is correlation when we begin to dip further, and I think we should. And there is nothing that can stop scientific curiosity uh, on ethical, proven basis. And, and I think that's the way to go. Well, it just seems to me, uh, just my concluding remarks are that we have the technology, as they say, to, to go bi-directionally with this. We have the MRI. Um, we have the ultrasound. We have the IVIS. Uh, what's to stop us, really, from, from pushing this is I really think of it as a Rosetta Stone, in a sense. Um, otherwise, you run the risk of, <laughs> and I'm thinking about the Millennium Project, Mark, you run the risk of, of doing lots and lots of scans on lots and lots of normals and lots and lots of patients. And uh, at the end of the day, you're scratching your head saying, ah, I should have had them sitting up, not laying down, because of the, you know, the, these subtle uh, but real uh, functional factors here. Um, you know, go for the gold, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. Raj, you, you're up. <laughs> We're just going to have a sort of a, a question just about them. Um, one of the things, as you sort of mentioned, the, the, the problem with trying to do interventional sham versus, you know, sham versus non, uh, treat versus non-treat. Um, one of the things I was wondering about, has anybody actually tried to sort of do what our friendly neighborhood neurologist has sort of implied, that basically if you have someone who's progressing, you know, if you're going to be changing their DMT, do one of those, like basically change DMT versus intervention with uh, CCSVI treatment. Has anyone tried to broach that? I guess, you know, one of the things is to have the neurologist here is actually the greatest start you can have. But that may be a simpler thing to get through IRB as opposed to like treating a, or not treating. So I, I think the momentum is changing and yeah. uh, the That's more IRBs that are interested in really pursuing this, there was initial hesitancy, but uh, there are others that will pursue. We certainly found our IRB to be very supportive um, of, uh, of pursuing this study. Uh, we'll see what the results are and our hope is not to be, you know, the, the last study that is done, but really the first study that is done to show that one, it can be done, second, patients can be randomized, third, patients can be blinded, and clinicians can be blinded, fourth, uh, all the different metrics that need to be evaluated. So our study includes, uh, we'll talk about it on Wednesday, all sorts of metrics which are patient-centered but also patient-independent really have the kind of data that would be required to convince not just the patients but also the neurologists that there's some value in it. But the most important goal for our study was just to show that it can be done and hopefully others will pursue. But I think once we have that, the next phase would be to start looking at patients who are not responding appropriately to conventional medical therapy to consider those cases. Bottom line, I think the, the sad part is that I heard a figure of 30,000 interventions have been done to date, and we have data on maybe 200 or 300. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's really dismal for a field that really is so nascent that we don't have consensus in anything. This is the phase where every single patient who is treated, no matter by whom, needs to have their data carefully recorded and presented at meetings like this. I mean, there should have been a full session in this meeting where every single interventionist was presenting their cases of 20 or 30 patients that they have done and what, their, what was their protocol, how did they treat, what were their outcomes. We just don't have that and that's really the saddest part, I think, of the affairs. Okay, we, we, have, we have 45 seconds, so... No, no, stay up, stay up. Yeah, so, These Carol last Tyler. two. I uh, come at this from a completely different technical background. Um, and I just wanted to make an observation, not ask a question. Sometimes the obvious observations are the ones that are overlooked. We, 
If you start with the neurology and the autoimmune attack on demyelinated uh, uh, neural axons, and you start with the vasculature on the other hand and measure flow, there's a huge gap, a space between these two disciplines. And I was really quite enlightened by the paper that John Cook gave the, you know, yesterday about the endothelium because now he is connecting vasculature and flow through the endothelium and what happens to the endothelium and how leukocytes manage to get through and start to uh, attack the vulnerable uh, neural axons and, uh, de and the myelin. It's just an observation. So there's been a, a few comments about the engagement of the uh, neurologist or the lack of engagement of neurologists. And I, I certainly can't speak for all of the neurologists, but one thing that may be a challenge in neurologists becoming engaged is the fuzziness around the ultrasound criteria and what qualifies patients for having CCSVI or not. And as a field, if you all, and I'm referring to the ultrasonographers, cannot agree on what is diagnostic criteria for this condition and what is not, whether criteria two is in or not. If you don't have QDP, can you do criteria two or not? And then what implications does that have for defining CCSVI or not? There, I, I've not heard clarity about that, and without clarity, it's very hard to engage the very simple-minded neurologists, and, and, and I speak for them because I am one of them. We're, we're just very simple people. Is it stenosis? Is it reflux? What is it? Is it different subsets, some stenotic, some refluxing? That's fine, but just give us clarity in a way that we can understand, and I think that will be easier. I, I do disagree a little bit with my colleague, Dr. Zavadinov, about doing additional more and more studies until we have clarity about the basic core elements. We have clarity about the basic identification of who has CCSVI and who does not before we then go on to iron studies and perfusion studies and so on and so forth. Because to me, that's putting the cart a little bit before the horse before we clearly identify, is this a condition related to all neurologic diseases? Uh, the, the ongoing studies that, uh, that uh, Robert and, and, and others are doing with other neurologic diseases compared to MS, is it a different prevalence in those other neurologic diseases compared to MS? And if not, what does that mean about its role in, in MS, its role in maybe accelerating the disease or not? I think some of those basic elements need to be answered before the neurologist can really become engaged in this and, and can embrace it. Uh, Robert, can I speak uh, to yes, that for but, a minute? But, you, know, sure. uh, you are claiming for, for clear definition, but remember, first description of multiple sclerosis what was given by Charcot was 1880-something, uh, and uh, uh, the revised McDonald's criteria was published in the 90s, so it took over 100 years for, uh, on the neurological uh, side. Perhaps this uh, sonographic definition also needs time to, 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 be, to be ironed. Well, and, and that's fine, but that's the challenge. It's very hard to engage the neurologist if the definitions haven't been clearly set and validated and reproducibility and cross-center. And that takes time. I, I, I recognize that. But it's very hard to engage the neurologist until that is established. It's very hard to get excited about some of the additional studies until some of the basic core elements are defined. So, so Robert, let me address wait, wait, this wait. for a minute, if I may. Um, so if we, uh, I think we have to be careful first that we're sticking at MS at the moment. Yes, there may be other neurological diseases which would be of interest for CCSVI, and I'm sure we're going to hear about some of that here, and I hope you're here tomorrow. But uh, one can also justify focusing in a given area uh, related to issues like flow, for example. If we look at uh, some of the data Robert has, he has probably close to a thousand cases that he's done in different studies. We now have almost 2,000 cases. Um, we're doing MR, not ultrasound. If you want to talk about ultrasound as being the criteria, then I think you're, you're absolutely right. There are these multiple questions and still really proof of concept until sites can replicate it. But it, the ability of ultrasound to do that or not relates more to the actual treatment not to the issue of the science. And the science can be addressed within MS and within other diseases, 
with the technologies we have, I think to a parallel degree to, to what you and all other neurologists today in the world are doing at Ectrams with 5,000 neurologists, you're using all sorts of neurochemistry, you're using all sorts of MRI, you're trying to tackle multiple sclerosis with diffusion tensor imaging and MTC, and you have no basis in doing that at all. It's just guesswork at the moment. I know because I've been doing that sort of thing for 25 years too, for different things and different diseases. And we do it because we're hoping to find something and make a contribution to the disease. But now we have a little more justification for focusing on why we're using these methods. It's not just a guess we might find something wrong with the lesions anymore. It's a guess of what might be happening pathophysiologically. So I can say that out of the 600 cases we've done so far with flow analysis, that there is clear evidence that the MS population has flow abnormalities in 25%. If your flow in the internal jugular veins is less than seven milliliters a sec, excuse me, a second, I don't find that in normals. And the more normals we do, of course, we'll have to give a percentage that 4% of normals have that low flow. And 25% of the multiple sclerosis population have that. And if you have a stenosis and you're a multiple sclerosis patient, the probability of that is very high. So we are at the cusp of answering what you're talking about. Enough, I think, to justify to the neurological community that all these methods that you're trying to use from angiography to diffusion to perfusion can now be integrated in a coherent attack on this problem that has some basis in vascular immunology. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to work together. We've all worked with the neurologists over the years, up to three years ago, approaching all of these questions you're talking about without the strong justification that we now have. So we should be continuing on the same track, but just a bit more focused, using this technique with a bit more focus on perfusion and flow. And, and I think it's very important to have yourself here and Randy here and, and Robert here, because we're going to see at this meeting quantifiable, reproducible data from site to site, from continent to continent. So I hope that you will be more convinced by the time you leave this meeting. One other comment about, <laughs> about multimodality. I mean, the point that I think Robert made, uh, I, I would strongly support that because there are inherent deficiencies in each and every one of these techniques. For instance, um, both uh, uh, Doppler um, and to a lesser extent MR, hopefully Mark's right and we'll get technologies, um, fail to really adequately, adequately uh, evaluate the azagous vein, which is the principal means of drainage uh, of the entire spinal cord for sure, but also in the upright position a significant part of the brain. And so uh, we don't have one means to really be able to detect uh, what we are finding. I think a hypothesis has been proposed and we are trying to bring all the tools that we have to bear to identify what really sticks, what does not. I think uh, Paolo made a phenomenal observation. It's amazing, four years down the road, we still have not been successfully been able to trim or add any one criteria uh, to date. Uh, so I think it's a, it's, it's a process and evolution. I think uh, what you've seen today really shows that we're trying to bring all different modalities to bear, and I don't think it's quite the time to start trimming any of these modalities down at this point. Okay. I had a comment uh, the, based on something Robert talked about, Angela, uh, about eliminating one of the criteria. Can, is it clear to, is it true to stay, say that the reason we want to trim that one is because uh, you need QDP in order to have a reliable uh, inter-observer methodology, or is QDP itself in question? It's itself in question. Yes. It is in question. Because I don't, I don't think that you do need it to. I think, I don't think you need it to interpret that that criteria. I mean, I don't have it, never have, and um, I mean, I've, I've used it, I trained on it. I mean, you were with me as well, so. I understand that, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, you know, necessary, and I have to agree with Dr. Siddiqui when he says, you know, I think it's that itself, because, you know, clearly you can interpret the deep cerebral veins without it. 
problem like it, on that level as far as the spectral so here's a problem that Robert brings up if you have two of the five criteria as positive and use that as an indication for venography and then you change that there are many patients who would not be indicated for angiography but I can tell you and I'm, when I go home I will start to analyze the data now retrospectively that many patients with immobile valves and septi have two criteria positive, one of which is criteria number two. So I think that we have to really address that. You know, maybe you only need one criteria to be indicated for a more invasive test. Sensitivity and specificity then, as I showed multiple times uh, in these two days, you know, you can go uh, to, to increase the sensitivity, but you are going to decrease your specificity. Because a lot of uh, uh, patients' uh, uh, healthy controls will fall in your category. Now, uh, clearly what we uh, presented at this Congress is, I think, the way to go uh, uh, does when you have ultrasound in experienced hands and you add the MRI just for the jugular veins, let's say, in terms of stenosis, we didn't observe very big differences in sensitivity and specificity, but adding collaterals, adding even the criteria number two, uh, increased our specificity. Uh, somewhat decreased our sensitivity. So, uh, uh, but we are poning a, a, an important question, which is, what are we going to do if we exclude criteria number two, and then we still stay with the two criteria, uh, uh, extracranial criteria? Can we call it CCSVI, and how will this affect all our prevalence studies uh, in the future, as well as screening for uh, invasive testing? We have screening tests. We have many of them, um, and we do them. They're expensive. Uh, they, they have risks. They lead to uh, negative biopsies. But we accept those risks because we want to have the greatest inclusion of patients who have symptoms that may be relieved. So perhaps I would argue the opposite, that if I end up doing venography on some normal controls, it would be they would not be asymptomatic controls because they would have symptoms. So we're, you know, it's true to have compare MS to healthy control, but it's a different thing to take a symptomatic patients and exclude those that need venography because they have none of the findings. That would certainly eliminate most of, well, I'm not sure it's most, but it would certainly be the screening test. If we're expecting the screening test to identify all the patients that are appropriate, uh, and we make that too rigid, then we will uh, take patients who have uh, potential therapeutic effects and eliminate them, which is not what a screening test should really do. So I, I think we have a, a new challenge here in to, to, to what you're suggesting of trying to have more criteria uh, is, or, or secondary testing uh, are very valuable. And we don't go from uh, screening mammography to uh, mastectomy. We, you know, we often will go screening mammography to ultrasound. And we use that all the time. Those are quite common. Or MRI, you know, we do that now. So I don't think we have to look at this screening test of ultrasound, which is a half a million people that need to be screened, uh, at least a half a million. Uh, we have to have something that's fairly safe, fairly inexpensive, fairly rapid, and then maybe we use our alternate testing for refinement. One thing, Robert, I think he has talked about this. It would be interesting to look at pulsatility. It's uh, another yeah. symbol that you should be. There's no reason why we can't really look at venous wall motion, the respiratory excursion, normal excursions, to see if that may have some. So I think that's how we pick up these criteria is that you first pass, you see a few, and then you, you add up on the data and you pick up on other, uh, other things. I mean, to also uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 comment on, on Dr. Fox's uh, uh, point, uh, I think that the future is definitely combination of the non-invasive criteria, and uh, especially the ultrasound and MRI. And uh, we know now that specificity is very high. We didn't test it, and we are doing in a small numbers 
against the, the invasive tests, but I think uh, that we feel much more confident when there is finding on both than just on, on one. And uh, with these additional tests, collaterals, and uh, that, that can even be better. So uh, uh, one thing I think in the screening is important, that we do not send somebody who should not be sent, that's my opinion, uh, that's why you are doing screening. Now, uh, uh, if we are going to miss uh, somebody, that's clearly an important question. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, and, and I don't see a, a, a way out of this, you know, easily. Right. I think we're almost done. This will be the last uh, comment or question. Uh, I would like to comment about what he was saying before. Well, I think we have to thank the doctor because he was saying that we are in front of an important key point. He says, you should engage us. Well, I want to tell you uh, about my experience. I am an interventional radiologist, and in my center we have done nearly 1,000 cases about CCS by. We do doing angiography, we do the, st the study of the left lumbar cir circulation all the time. We have noticed that in primary progressive people there is no lumbar ascending on the left side. And we have noticed this, this finding in more than 97% of patients. As you know, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, uh, understand if patients in primary progressive or in secondary progressive, because some patients think that their disease is uh, relapsing remitting, instead over time they find out that the disease is uh, primary progressive. So this is, could be a very important market. A marker because, uh, as I, I told you before, it's very difficult sometimes to do the right diagnosis. So I told my neurologist that uh, I, I found out this, and he replied to me, Well, it's not enough. So I think that if you say it's not enough, instead to, to say, Well, it makes sense, we can go forward and try to understand more because this is can important. There is no way to engage you. So you ask us uh, criteria, but if we uh, give you some criteria and you say it's not enough, we are very distant. So we try to engage you, but you have to come towards us and, and understand that all of us are at the beginning of the experience. So we can't give you all the criteria, but we have to go together and try to understand this disease without pretending that now we should uh, uh, have understand everything. Thank you. Well, that, that ends our session, and uh, we didn't shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs>